So today we are in week three of our new series called Signs. Uh, in case anybody missed those first couple of weeks, what we are doing is uh, taking a particular road sign each week, uh, taking the basic meaning of that road sign and turning it into a sermon. Um, and as you can see here to my left, we've got a couple of signs here, if you can see them. We had uh, the first week, week one, caution, entering construction zone, because we as Christians, we as people, really are always under construction, always trying to grow, always trying to improve, and as Christians, being molded by God as a potter molds clay. Last week, we looked at one way, and where Jesus made it clear that there is only one way to heaven, and he made it clear that he is the only way. Today we look at the sign, Bump Ahead. Uh, you might see some different signs that look like this when you see it. You may see a sign that just says, Bump. But anytime you see a sign letting you know that there is a bump of some sort ahead, uh, it's a warning sign. It could be a speed bump or it could just be a bump in the road where they're doing construction or where there's uh, the, the road's in terrible shape. Now. We'll get into just a minute, I'll briefly tell you what you need to do when you see a sign on the road, a warning sign that tells you that there's a bump ahead. Uh, you have no idea you're going to get you a little driving lesson today, but uh, we'll have a little bit in there about it. But what happens if, I've said it before, a lot of signs on the road, we miss them or we just ignore them? What happens if you miss or ignore this sign right here that says bump ahead and you hit a bump, whether it's a speed bump or some big bump at full speed. Well, nothing could happen, or you could cause some serious damage to your vehicle. Hitting a bump, a speed bump or any other bump at full speed could um, cause your suspension in your car to have some issues. Uh, it could cause your shocks, something wrong to happen with your shocks. If you've got something hanging low in your car, it could hit the bump, bump and it could fall off. Um, Drivers found that around half of the repairs counted for tire damage with bumps. 33% uh, had to deal with suspensions. But hitting a speed bump obviously can also affect your vehicle's uh, driving, the steering of the vehicle. If you hit that speed bump too fast, far too often anyway, and you might notice that your car starts veering a little bit to the right or the left if you take your hands off the wheel, and if so, you may need to go get your car checked. It may be out of the line. You may have to get it realigned. So what should be done if you see a warning sign that there is a bump ahead? Well, as Christians or as people who are driving, we should be aware. Start looking out for that bump. Be ready to look for it. Wait for it. Uh, and then as you're aware, you slow down as you come up on this bump and you hold on to the steering wheel. There's your quick driving lesson for this morning. But what happens when we hit bumps in life? That's the real question. What happens when we don't see something coming uh, and we get some bad news? What happens if we hear that one of our family members or someone we love is sick and it doesn't look good? What happens if we lose a job? What happens if our house catches on fire and burns to the ground? What happens if we ourselves hit a bump and we sin against God? You know, there are lots of different kinds of bumps in life that we come up against. And when we see that a speed bump is coming, or we're about to hit one in life, we've got to be aware, we've got to slow down, and we got to hold on to God. So let's look at a few people in the Bible today who had bumps in their lives. These are people we are, are, who are famous, people we are very uh, admire, people we study, people we learn from, people that can teach us how to live the right way. But they all, like us, had bumps in life. Think about Samson, the strongest man. I remember from 20 years ago or so, I used to watch the strongest man competitions on ESPN. They weren't the fittest men, but they were strong. So they pulled vehicles. They picked up heavy weight and carried it for distances or picked up heavy weight and tossed it. And the key was to do it as fast as you could. And you would do several different competitions and you would get points for who finished first, second, third, all the way down the line. And after all the competitions, you had a winner. Well, Samson would have been perfect in one of these strongest man competitions. I don't know if anybody on earth has ever had the brute strength that Samson had. 
Well, Samson had his issues. You can read about his deeds in the book of Judges, all of his, his life in the book of Judges, Judges uh, chapters 13 through 16. God chose Samson to be a Nazarite, to deliver Israel from the Philistines. And this position really was uh, dependent upon whether Samson would hold fast to the Nazarite vow. The Nazarite vow meant he had to be consecrated to God, he had to be pure in character, he had to never cut his hair. Um, he had to abstain from wine or anything with grapes. So it wasn't just about the hair that we know about. But Samson was thriving in life. He was doing well. So what went wrong? What type of bump did he hit in life? Well, Samson chose to become infatuated by the physical beauty of heathen women. His infatuation with Delilah was fatal to his mission. To the task that God had before him of being judged over Israel and delivering Israel. You could say the secret to Samson's weakness was not in the fact that his hair was cut, but more so in his irrational, blinded love of Delilah. She exploited Samson. She exploited his devotion so that she could get information from him so that she could help defeat Israel. But Samson had fallen head over heels for beautiful Delilah. He gave in. He finally told her, after several attempts of her trying to get it from him, that if his hair was cut, he would lose all of his strength. But how did he inspire us still? See, the story of Samson kind of reminds us that the world offers a lot of different kind of temptations out there that can take us down the wrong road fast and ultimately leads us away from God and his values. Like all the best Bible characters out there, the people we study and admire, Samson proved to be the man he ought to be in the end. He realized his mistake, asked God for forgiveness and restoration. He got his strength back and he, he could fulfill his task and deliver Israel even though it cost him his life. Samson was cruising along in life. Everything was just going smooth for him. Nothing could stop Samson. And then he hit a major bump in life. A bump he wasn't prepared for. There's a time where he lost focus. Where he wasn't really aware of what was going on. He didn't slow down. And he lost sight of God for that moment. And then there's Jonah, the runaway prophet. Maybe you've heard about or watched the movie Runaway Bride with Julia Roberts in it. that came out in 1999. It was a very popular movie. It's about a woman who uh, had left several fiancés at the altar at their wedding and just ran away. They were all caught on video, and so she was nicknamed Runaway Bride. Well, Jonah's the runaway prophet. Jonah, uh, if you remember, if you were here a couple years ago, I did a series on Jonah a couple of years ago called Not So Different was the series. And it was a series for each chapter, uh, or a sermon for each chapter, uh, four weeks long. And it was all about how we are not so different from Jonah in a lot of different ways. God gave him the task, the duty of going to Nineveh and delivering or preaching a message of repentance to Nineveh. Now, the people in the city of Nineveh were evil. They were wicked. Some of the worst people that you could find on the face of this earth. But God wanted them to repent. So who does he decide to send? He tells Jonah the prophet to go and do it. That was the tough job that prophets had sometimes. God had a message that needed to be delivered. And the prophets were the ones who had to deliver it. And often it was something that a nation did not want to hear. Because they were often telling them about something they were doing wrong. But it was up to the prophet to do it. So what went wrong with Jonah? Well, as you know, Jonah ran away. He ran away from this task that God wanted him to do of preaching to the people of Nineveh. He, ran, he tried to run away as far as he possibly could, literally. He tried to run away as far as the known world at that time. He didn't want to do it. He didn't want these people of Nineveh who were so wicked to have a chance to repent. Eventually, Jonah went. He preached that message of repentance to the people of Nineveh. And they repented. Jonah became frustrated because he thought these people of Nineveh should be punished. They should be killed. That was the plan all along, he thought. 
So Jonah becomes frustrated. Things went wrong for Jonah here. He had a major bump in life when he tried to run away from God. But how does his story still inspire us? The story of Jonah reminds us that God is always willing to forgive us. Even if we run away from him. While Jonah preached for the people of Nineveh to repent, God also taught Jonah a major life lesson about God's endless love, forgiveness, and mercy. This story reminds us that God withdraws his judgment on the sinner who repents and seeks his forgiveness. Even when we hit bumps in life, and it seems like we've committed the greatest sin possible, God's always willing and able to forgive us. Then there was Mary Magdalene, the possessed. Stories of Samson and Jonah, they're more common. They're more well-known among the church. If you grew up in the church as a kid, if you went to vacation Bible schools or church camps or wherever, you probably heard the stories of Jonah and Samson several times as a kid. Typically not the case with Mary Magdalene. So, you know, Mary Magdalene, Magdalene is not her last name. She's called Mary Magdalene because she was Mary from the village of Magdala. There are several different Marys you can read about in the Bible, especially the New Testament. But Mary Magdalene, she was that one who stuck by Jesus throughout his whole ministry. She was there from early on in his ministry. She was there at the crucifixion. She was one of the women who went to the tomb on the day that Jesus resurrected to put spices on the body. She's famous for those things. But she's also famous for the fact that she was the first person to ever see Jesus after his resurrection. Some would say that of all the women in the Bible, Mary Magdalene is the most fortunate because of where she started and where she ended. What was wrong with her in her life? What bumps did she have in life? It seems well. It seems like her life was great. What major bump did she hit? What did she have? Well, let's look at what Luke says about her when she comes on scene in Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 2. Soon afterward, Jesus went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. She was famous for following Jesus so closely. She went with him everywhere. She was like one of his disciples. But she was also famous because she was a woman who was once possessed by seven demons. Now Jesus healed a lot of people who were sick. Jesus also drove out many demons and evil spirits from people. But Mary Magdalene is that one person that he drove out evil spirits from who we continue to read about in the scriptures. Many of the others, we, we hear that they were excited, that they maybe talked about Jesus, and then that was it. But we continue to hear about Mary Magdalene. She had a major bump in life. She was possessed. She was an outcast. She would have been feared by people because she was possessed by demons. But she ends up becoming someone who, who has inspired people now for almost 2,000 years. Because when she came in contact with Jesus, her life was then centered around Jesus, around being close to Jesus side by side. The story of Mary Magdalene, it brings a powerful message of endless hope in God. That no demons or evil spirits can withstand the presence of God. And let's look at Zacchaeus. That wee little man. You know, we love singing that song as kids. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. You can read the story of Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Zacchaeus was a tax collector, which makes him one of the most hated people in the Bible. We don't like the IRS sometimes today in our world, do we? And our taxes being taken on us. Well, tax collectors then were hated. They were despised by people. The Jews could not stand these tax collectors because these tax collectors were Jews, their own people, who were working for the Romans. So Zacchaeus, the tax collector, when he heard Jesus was coming to his town, what does he do? He wastes no time in going out to see Jesus. 
in spite of who he was, being a tax collector, it must have been more than just curiosity that kind of intrigued him here. I think a process of repentance and a change of heart was already starting to take place within his heart. What was wrong with this man, though? Zacchaeus, what bumps did he have in life? Well, his bump was certainly of his own choosing. His bump, his difficulties in life came with the fact that he was a tax collector. These tax collectors, they not only collected tax from the Jewish people, their own people, they were allowed to do so, but they then collected more money than they were actually owed. So in reality, they were really robbing or stealing from their own people and allowed to do so. Although Zacchaeus was a short man, he was brave enough to steal from his own people. Tax collectors, they were considered as corrupt to the core. They weren't phased in any way by taking money from their own people, from their own country. It's a tough bump to get over. But Zacchaeus heard Jesus was coming to town. He took the risk. He climbed up into that tree just so he could hear Jesus, just so he could see Jesus. And Jesus stops and talks to him and tells him, come down. I'm going to your house. He goes, and Zacchaeus became a changed man. Now he's not, he wasn't even willing, he wasn't just willing to pay people back their taxes that, they had, uh, that, that, that he had stolen from them, the extra money. He says he'll pay them back fourfold. Zacchaeus reminds us that God's words are powerful enough. Powerful enough to transform us from our sinful state, from the simple life we are living. If only we choose not to harden our hearts. See, four simple people from the Bible. Samson, the strong man, the strongest man, gave in to his wife Delilah. Jonah, the prophet who ran away. Mary Magdalene, a possessed woman. Zacchaeus, a tax collector. They all had bumps in life, but each of them, after their bumps in life, came close to God. You can look at a lot of other people throughout the scriptures. I'm like Joseph. Think about Joseph back in Genesis. If anybody ever hit a bump in life that didn't deserve it, it was Joseph. He didn't do anything wrong. He was just sold by his brothers as a slave because they were jealous of him. He was a slave for years. Yet he continued to trust God. Those disciples, they were a bunch of nobodies in life until Jesus came into their lives. Even the closest friends of Jesus didn't believe he had resurrected until they saw him with their own eyes. So you won't find any adult in the world, any adult in life, who hasn't had to face some bumps in life and learn how to get over them. So what about us? We know we're going to face bumps in life. It's inevitable. We can't get away from it. So what do we need to do? Well, if you remember, I said there are three things we need to do if we see a road sign warning us that there's a bump ahead on the road. We become aware that there is a bump, so we start looking out for it. Then we slow down, and we keep our hands on the wheel. And so as Christians, if we are facing, or human beings really, as Christians especially, if we are facing a bump in life, we've got to be aware. To be aware means that you have knowledge or you have uh, some perception of some situation or a fact. And we as Christians, we need to be aware of the fact that we have an enemy attacking us at all times, at all levels. Peter had these words to say in 1 Peter 5 8. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. This is not me trying to scare someone into being a Christian or trying to scare someone into uh, becoming a follower of Christ. But the devil's real. There's no other explanation for all the evil in this world. Someone created it. Someone keeps it going. And the devil is not some little red guy smiling in a suit with a pitchfork and a tail. We've portrayed him as that in many ways. The devil is our opponent. He's our adversary. The Bible says Satan is the father of lies. 
And Peter tells us we got to be on the alert. We need to be looking out. We need to be aware because our adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Think about a lion in Africa prowling around in the weeds waiting for its prey. And when it's time, he just pounces on it. Satan is just like that. You don't know why marriages hit bumps? You want to know why relationships hit bumps or why there's so much evil in this world? Well, you just have to look at the source of evil. Satan. We need to be aware. Just like we become aware that a speed bump is coming up on us. We need to look out. We also need to slow down. Slow down when we come up on a bump in the road, right? Now, there can be all kinds of bumps in the road. Different colors, different shapes, different sizes. Uh, some of them are man-made and put there. Some of them are just where the road is in bad shape. But when we are aware that a bump is coming, it's time to slow down. <coughs> and let's face it. In life, it feels more like this sometimes. It feels like bump after bump after bump after bump. It's like we can't catch a break sometimes. Now, I would not like driving on a road like this. I'd hate it. But I also don't like living in a life where it's bump after bump after bump after bump that you're having to get over. So sometimes in life, as we go through these bumps, we have to slow down. We have to be still. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I'll be exalted in the earth. When we're about to face an uphill battle, when we're about to hit a bump, or we are going through some stretch where we're hitting bumps right now, it's time to be aware and slow down. Be still and let God take over, because it's then that God can work in us and through us. But when we're going too fast and we're not paying attention to God, God doesn't have that opportunity. We don't allow it. Slow down. And finally, when we're going over that bump in the road, we've got to hold onto the steering wheel. If not, it's possible we could lose control of the car. As Christians, we must hold on to God. I love the words of James chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. If we want to hold on to God, if we want to stay close to God, we've got to do what James says here. It starts with submitting to God. Zacchaeus was hated. He was despised. He was, as a tax collector, nobody liked him. But before Jesus came through that town, he must have started having a change of heart. He wanted to see Jesus bad. Submitting to God has to start with having a change of heart. And you see, when we're aware of our adversary, when we're aware of the devil, when we're aware of Satan, and when we slow down, Submitting to God can become so much easier. Because it's at this point right then, we'll be able to resist the devil. And as James wrote, he will flee from you. Doesn't mean he won't come back, but you've won that battle. And then James tells us that after we have submitted to God, after we resisted the devil, it's time to draw near to God. It's time to hold on close to God. It's time to be a child of God. How is it that we come close to God? How is it we become a child of God? Well, we start by putting our faith in God. Faith in uh, believing that Jesus is the Son of God, that the Word of God is true. Faith in believing that Jesus is who He says He is. And with faith in the Bible, it always drove people to action. So once we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we confess that Jesus is who He said He is. Jesus said these words in Matthew 10, 32. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. So we make that statement. The one that Peter made when Jesus was with his disciples and he asked, Who do people say I am? And Peter says, You're the Christ, the Son of God. And once we put our faith in God, and our faith in Jesus, God calls us to repentance. Repentance is a major theme throughout the entire Bible. You can't get away from it. Repentance is all about how we need to change. 
We need to give up the life we're living for ourselves and start living for God. It's that 180 degree turn. It's like you're walking down this road for yourself, living for yourself, and you turn around and you start walking and living for God. It's a change of heart. It's a change of mind. And then once we put our faith in Jesus, once we've confessed Jesus before others and we have a repentant heart, Jesus said we need to be baptized. And the word they used for baptized, Greek word, they had several, they had different words for baptized, but the word, the Greek word they used meant to be immersed, to be taken under the water. Just as Jesus was buried in the grave, we are buried in the waters of baptism. In Mark 16, 16, Jesus was speaking. And Jesus said these words. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. When Jesus says something, we need to take it to heart. But Peter also, on the very day that the church began, was preaching that first gospel message, the first message of Jesus being the Christ, of Jesus the Messiah, to a large crowd of people. They showed their faith because the Bible says they were pricked, they were convinced that Jesus is the Christ, and in showing their faith, they asked, what do we need to do? What must we do? They wanted to know what they needed to do to be saved. The first time that question was ever, answered, was ever asked, on the day the church began, and it was answered this way. And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It really doesn't get any clearer than that right there. It was the answer on the day that the church began, and it must be the answer today. If we want to draw close to God, if we want to hold on close to God, we have to submit to God. We have to become a child of God. Bump ahead. It's inevitable. We're going to face bumps in life. We're going to face lots of bumps in life. We can't avoid them. Just like driving down the road. You're going to hit bumps. Bumps are part of life. But when we do hit those bumps, remember, be aware. Be alert of our enemy. Slow down. Let God work. And hold on to God. So whenever you see a sign warning you that there's a bump ahead, remember to be aware. Slow down. And hold on to God. We're going to sing our hymn of invitation this morning. You know, we face a lot of moments in life where we have bumps, where we have bruises, where we have things that just affect us all in a lot of different ways, difficult moments in life. But it's wonderful to know that we have a God who loves us and is willing and able to forgive us. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you always have the opportunity to do so. Reach out to us. Let's make that happen. We're going to stand and sing the first and last verses.